With almost 300 people killed in Baghdad last week and a landmark damning report into the Iraq war finally published in the UK, this week's Upfront special asks, is Tony Blair to blame? I'm Mehdi Hassan. With almost 300 people killed in Baghdad last weekend, I'll ask Iraq's first post-war defense minister, Ali Alawi, whether the invasion itself was the original sin. But first, does this week's Iraq inquiry report by former UK government official Sir John Chilcott go far enough in holding Tony Blair to account? That's our debate featuring two former members of Blair's inner circle. Claire Short quit his cabinet in the wake of the invasion and has since called Iraq a crime against peace and John McTernan served as Blair's director of political operations and is an outspoken defender of the invasion. Thanks both for joining me on Upfront. Uh, Claire Short, does the Chilcot report confirm, does it validate what you've been saying about Tony Blair and the Iraq war over the past decade? Yes, the report is written in very polite language, as you'd expect from a sort of Whitehall establishment origin person. But it's a devastating critique, and it upholds all the criticisms that the critics have made, from exaggerating the intelligence to pretend that there was um, an imminent threat, concocting the legal advice in an improper way, rushing to war before the diplomatic solutions had been exhausted, so it might have been possible to allow Blix to go on. There was no imminent threat. Um, and on and on it goes. Everything that the critics are not preparing properly for afterwards. You, you say everything, and it, and it is a devastating report, no doubt about that. You say everything, but it doesn't say explicitly, does it, that Blair lied or misled uh, Parliament or the public, which is something you've said in the past. Do you still believe uh, Tony Blair misled the people, misled you, that he lied about the threat from Iraq? Absolutely. And, you know, Blair's response has all been to say, I'm very, very, very sorry, but I would do it all exactly the same again. So I don't know what exactly he's supposed to be sorry for. But, and he said, and he says, I didn't deceive anyone. Well, if you add up all the things it says that he exaggerated or didn't, wasn't frank about and, for example, blaming the French and saying that meant they couldn't get a second resolution because Chirac had said um, he would veto anything. When he didn't, he said, not now. I mean, these are deceits, but it's polite language, so they haven't used the word deceit. And now Blair and his entourage are saying, oh, he really was sincere, uh, he didn't deceive okay. or manipulate well, anyone. Well, he did. I think okay. he was sincere in believing he should go with Bush. But, but, but deceit but is the word you're deceive. using. There's John, no question. Let me ask John McTernan. Uh, deceit there. They may not, he may not have used the word deceit, uh, Sir John Chilcott, in his report, but the evidence in his report is clear that he did mislead. He was involved in deception, Claire Short says. No, he says exactly the opposite, doesn't he? He says that um, Tony Blair presented the intelligence as it was presented to him. He didn't lie to Parliament. Um, in fact, he's clear. No, he doesn't say that. That is not true. Uh, that just, is not no, true. That's not what the report says. It's clear of says. all the things. Cleared of all the things that have just been said. No, it's, he's, cle he's cleared of all of those things that Claire has just asserted. And she's having to really stretch the definition of deceit to almost mean tell the truth to I accuse invite Tony to read of the um, telling the truth. He was a completely read straight. Read the summary. Tony was completely straightforward earlier this week on Wednesday when the report came out. Really clear about this. He um, uh, he said. He's taken responsibility for mistakes that weren't his, the mistakes of the military, the mistakes of the security services. He was prime minister. He takes responsibility for them, which I think is a leadership thing to do. And then he's also said uh, that uh, he cannot, and he said this consistently, he cannot regret the fact that Saddam Hussein is no longer in charge uh, of Iraq. And I think that's that, that is true. We cannot regret the fact that a genocidal dictator, genocidal fascist dictator, uh, was removed from power in Iraq. Tony Blair says, uh, and you're agreeing with him, that he's exonerated on the specific charge of lying. And we can have a, a pedantic def uh, argument about, you know, what is the definition of yeah. lying. But on pretty much everything else, John, uh, the failure to exhaust diplomatic options, Iraq not being an imminent threat, the lack of post-war planning, Chilcot is, you would admit, pretty damning. Your former boss is not going to live this down, is he? It's basically his political epitaph. Of course, it's not his political epitaph. Um, the, it's, it's absolutely clear uh, that there are many, many things about Tony Blair's uh, contribution to, the, to 
to Britain, to Europe uh, and to the world when he's prime minister, which will help to define how he's seen by history. But however, let's go to the, let's go to the report. Let's be clear about the report. Um, there are occasions when Sir John Tilcott was making a statement yesterday when I'd pretty well say he was sexing up his executive summary. He, um, he, he interposed his judgment with that of the prime minister. It was clear that there have been 17 UN Security Council resolutions, that the way to try to bring this to a head was to give a deadline uh, for Saddam Hussein. There's a deadline. He had a month to actually cooperate just with the UN Weapons Inspectors. Just a minute. This won't do. We're supposed to be discussing half, the Jilkot report. Had three and, now we're getting had, a justification and a half, of the war. Three, it's nothing. Johnny, three and a half, Johnny, three and a half like months Johnny, it does sound that. like you're trying to re-prosecute an argument that a seven-year, 2.6 million report has now pretty much put to bed. Military action might have been necessary at some it point, put it to but bed. there was no imminent threat no. from Saddam. The strategy of containment could have been adopted. The government failed in its stated objectives. That, that, that is the opinion. That is purely the opinion. So you reject purely the, the Chilcot report? Of Sir John Sil Chilcot. In hindsight, I, re I, re I reject the I reject. It's not just judgment. John Chilcot, it's he the made whole judgment. committee. He, was, he made a judgment. Sir John Chilcot made a judgment about what he would have done or what could have been done in terms of military options and peaceful options. It's not just Tony him. Tony Blair it's made the a different judgment. The cabinet committee. made a different it's judgment. It's not just him. And they, it's, it is Sir John. No, Sir John no, that's Chilcott's not true statement either. The cabinet was a didn't clear interposition. Properly. Was a clear interposition oh. of himself. He substitutes his judgment for Tony Blair's judgment. Okay, John McTernan. Post-war Iraq has suffered 13 years of violence. Nearly 300 people killed by ISIL in Baghdad last weekend alone. The same ISIL that even Tony Blair has now conceded is a byproduct of the invasion. Shouldn't we therefore see more contrition? from supporters of the war, and yet you seem more defiant uh, than you seem contrite, even with ISIL reminding us every week of what a disaster the Iraq intervention was. ISIS remind us every week that terrorists who are killers are moral agents. Nothing, nothing uh, can take away from them their responsibility for every single murder that they kill. The Iraq war is not responsible? Every single murder. The Iraq war is not responsible for no, giving us ISIS. ISIS no, no, you, Tony you, Blair you, can, said you that. cannot tell me. Well, Tony Blair you has said you that, John. Your, your former boss no, has said there are elements of truth in the argument. Sorry, that you're, talk, you're talking to me. Yes. You're talking to me. Okay, so you disagree you're with Blair. To me. And I'm asking let, you, let, do let, you let, disagree let, with Blair? Let, let's be ab it's a simple question. Do you I'm agree with you, Tony I'm Blair? Absolutely clear. I'm, 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 ab yeah, I'm absolutely clear about this, which is that terrorists are responsible for the murders that they commit. Nobody else is responsible. They can't say a big boy did it and he ran away or a big boy made me do it. They are killing Iraqis themselves. Agreed. But did they the Iraq should, war play any role and they should in, be stopped. in giving ISIS that space to exist, to kill, to exploit instability and chaos? Because Tony Blair has conceded that there is truth and in the that. And the head argument. of MI5, the head the head of MI5, the intelligence agency in Britain, gave evidence to Chilcott, is quoted in the report, saying that she and her agency predicted in advance that an invasion would lead to a growth of terrorism coming out of Britain as well as internationally. The warnings were made. ISIS didn't exist before. Of course, each person who kills another person is responsible, but creating the conditions that generate this kind of behavior is also John, a responsibility. John, do you want to respond to that? A very big responsibility. In my, look, in, in, yeah, in, my, in, in, my, in my view, uh, the, 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 the biggest blow recently to Iraqi security is the cowardice of David Cameron and of uh, Gordon Brown and of President Obama in deciding to cut and run, not to stay, not to stay and support the Iraqi security services, not to fin finish the work of the surge, not to complete the rebuilding of the army, not to complete the building of the police forces and the security services. And I think that's the disgrace, the betrayal. The Americans uh, wanted of the to retain US a base, and the, UK, and the Iraqis who did not, who them. did, who did, who did the, <laughs> the U.S. and the U.K. who did not want to have did not have the strategic patience that's required uh, to rebuild a nation. John, that's John let me ask you this. Destroyed, not by the war, but by dictatorship, okay. by that fascist. Let me ask please, the Americans that wanted the civil, to the remain. Civil society institutions. Uh, and, and the Iraqi government that was put in place by the occupying powers said no. John McTernan, you worked with Tony Blair after the war. You've stayed in touch with him since. Give us your insight into his mind. Uh, we know from the Chilcot report that he told Bush in secret that I will be with you whatever eight months before the war. OK. And we know what that phrase was a reference to. It was a reference to the events ten months before that memo was written. The, the reference was, as you know, 
to 9-11. And Tony Blair, in that memo, was expressing the view of every single citizen of the United Kingdom that we stood shoulder to shoulder in solidarity with America and Americans. Uh, Come on, John, that memo was about Iraq. On America. It was a very specific, I don't think it George was not, Bush that read was, that. that, that the that, memo was that, about Iraq. The very next sentence is about that Iraq. Memo, that was clear. That was a clear. That was a that was a clear expression of the solidarity which all British people had at the time with America about uh, the worst ever uh, domestic terrorism inflicted. In Most America. people who have read that memo, politicians, journalists, the Chilcot Committee, have come to pretty yeah, much one me, conclusion. Know, it's basically you, sure. Tony Blair, and maybe seven people think that didn't mean a blank no, check for war. Tony, no, no, come on, come man, on, no, John. No, man, I'm you, with you. Whatever. You, know, you okay. You, you know, Claire knows, everybody watching this program knows, there was a vote in the House of Commons, a vote, a free vote in the House of Commons to on whether Britain should go to war. Let me ask you so this, John. You Let me ask you this, John. Do you think you can't that free give vote... a blank check if you're going okay. to have a vote in the House of Commons? Here's a question. Do you think, if we had a time machine, do you really think that House of Commons vote would have been won had those MPs read the Chilcot report before they voted? Come on, honestly, John. Do you really think they would have won, they would have won that? They, no chance. They, but that, that's just a, I mean, that's just a ridiculous thought experiment. Well, they, it's the, saying they, the have more, Commons, they would have had like more information cabinet, than they have. Made the decision. Well, they, but you're, no, you're saying that if they, you're not saying they have a time machine, they'd have, they'd have the vision of the future. Right? Well, they would, John Chilcott's point they, is it's not about the future, it's, it's about what's already won. I, w I, won't, I, won't, I, won't do a I won't I won't vote now on this thing, which may have these consequences in the future, which I now know but about. But he was warned come, about the consequences. The that's the whole me. point, John. Ridonculous. Claire, let me ask you this Ridonculous. before we finish. Well, he was warned about the consequences. That's what the Chilcott report says. I you know see, you don't, I know you don't agree no, with it. Please, let me say on, this. The, the, the thing about deceit or people being misled is actually crucial to the vote in the House of Commons. Lots of people voted on explanations that were not true about the nature of the legal advice, about the BLICS process, about an imminent threat, about what the French position really was, and so on. So, yes, there was... There was and also, and there was a massive arms twisting and calls to loyalty and all the rest of it, but people voted on a false pr prospectus, to use Ming Campbell's phrase. People voted believing what Tony was saying, and now the Chilcot report says that was not the true picture. Final question to you both. Uh, you bo Claire, you supported the war and then changed your mind or you, you resigned later. Uh, John McTernan, you supported it, still support it. Putting aside all the political arguments, all the claims, counterclaims, Chilcot, etc. Iraq uh, is, a, is a mess. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people have died. People still continue to be killed. Um, how much do those deaths uh, weigh on your consciences at all? Uh, John first, then Claire. Every single death uh, in Iraq, uh, whether it was in, in the war, whether it's at the hands of terrorists, is a, is, is a loss, to, not just to the, uh, to the families of the, of the deceased, but also to their communities and to the country as a whole. Of course, all that loss of life is to be regretted. But in the balance, I cannot regret that Saddam Hussein, a genocidal fascist dictator who was killing his own people uh, unchallenged uh, before, that, that he was uh, removed from power in Iraq. Claire Short, final word? Yes, terrible regret. And I think people right across Britain hang their head in shame and feel deeply upset about what's happened. And then, of course, there's the 179 families in Britain who say, who've lost soldiers um, during the war who say, of course, if you go into the military, you may take that risk. But if the cause was ignoble, then it twists the knife in the wound because they're their loved ones died for something that was wrong. So, yes, deep regret, terrible. No one can put it right, but the whole of the country virtually is, is full of sorrow and regret. Thanks both for joining me on Upfront. The Iraq Inquiry report is finally out. But did we really need to wait seven years for Sir John Chilcott's report to realize that A, the Iraq war was a catastrophic disaster, and B, that we were lied into it? Tony Blair has always claimed he was given bad intel, but he didn't lie. What I do not in any way accept is that there was any deception of anyone. I refute any suggestion that we misled either Parliament or the people. I do not accept that I did. There were no lies. Parliament and Cabinet were not misled. But the accusation isn't that he knew there weren't any WMDs in Iraq and just pretended there were. It's that he misled us about what he was being told. How so? We know that he has stockpiles 
of major amount of chemical and biological weapons. Scary stuff. And yet only a month before that NBC News interview, his own intelligence committee had told him that their intel on WMDs was sporadic and patchy. They believed Iraq had not stockpiles, but some small stocks and small quantities of weapons. There is no doubt at all that the development of weapons of mass destruction by Saddam Hussein poses a severe threat not just to the region but to the wider world. But again, Blair's own officials were telling him just a month earlier that Saddam has not succeeded in seriously threatening his neighbours. Yes, he was a vile dictator, but no doubt a severe threat to the region. Sorry, Tony, your pants were on fire. So far as our objective, it is disarmament, not regime change. That is our objective. It's not regime change. It's not regime change, he said. Twice. Regime change being illegal, of course. And yet Blair's foreign policy advisor had told the Americans in private only a few months before that interview that Blair would not budge in his support for regime change, but had to manage the press, parliament and public opinion. In fact, we now know, thanks to the Chilcot report, that Blair told Bush in a secret memo eight months before the war that I will be with you whatever, whatever. And yes, the very nuanced Sir John Chilcot doesn't call Blair a liar, but he does say that Blair's claims about WMDs were presented with a certainty that was not justified. If that's not misleading people, I don't know what is. Oh, and if you think this Iraq inquiry report has put the whole debate to bed, has given us closure, it's time now to move on. Well, tell that to the families of the hundreds of thousands of people who've been killed in Iraq since 2003 and who continue to be killed there, even today. For an Iraqi perspective on the Chilcot Report, I'm joined now by Ali Alawi, who served as Iraq's first post-war defence minister and later finance minister. Ali Alawi, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Do you believe Tony Blair will ever face uh, some kind of prosecution at an international or even domestic level uh, for launching uh, what many call an illegal war, a crime of aggression? Should he be prosecuted, in your view? Well, I think there are two questions here, whether, whether he will be prosecuted. I think I doubt, I doubt it very much. Uh, I find it extremely difficult to see how a former prime minister uh, would be brought up to trial. It would, it would create a huge traumatic event in the uh, some political life of this country. But uh, whether he should be is, I think, a question that has to be decided by those who felt uh, directly grieved by what had happened in Iraq, in particular uh, the family of uh, some servicemen as well as uh, Iraqis. They would have to bring a case against him. In my personal view, I think he needs to be uh, chastised. He needs, he needs to make a very open and formal apology, which he hasn't so far. Many Iraqi exiles living abroad back in 2002, 2003, supported the US-UK war against Saddam Hussein, the invasion of Iraq. They wanted to get rid of Hussein's dictatorship, no matter the cost. Uh, did you? I was uh, public about my opposition to any, uh, any invasion, let alone an occupation. Uh, but I think it's also a bit of a, uh, a false accusation to imply that the entire Iraqi opposition was cheering for a war. They, in fact, a large number of leading opposition figures made it clear that they would not welcome a, uh, an invasion of the country as a way to get rid of Saddam. You say you didn't support the invasion, let alone the occupation, but you then went on to serve in Iraq's uh, post-war government. You were appointed as the first defense minister by the Interim Iraqi Governing Council, which itself was appointed by the Americans in 2003. Why did you take that job? Why did you make yourself complicit in the disaster of that US-led occupation of your country? No, complicit, I think, is far too strong a word here. The fact that the deed was done, and there's nothing that I could do to stop a whole a uh, chain of events, a steamroller that was uh, put into effect, not in 2003, but was put into effect soon after 9-11. And the fact that I had spent nearly my entire adult life in opposition to dictatorship, and the dictator was removed, albeit by uh, an outlandish act, an outrageous act in many ways, made, made me responsible for uh, taking a part, at least as much as I could, uh, in the process of reconstruction and recovery. And that's a very fair uh, point, but you use uh, the word... That's a very fair point. You use the word responsible. I mean, you wrote an entire book about the occupation and the, and the failures of the occupation. Therefore, are you not responsible for some of those failures, having served in that quote-unquote occupation government, the, post, the US appointed government before elections? 
Well, first of all, I was not appointed by the U.S. government. I was appointed by the Iraqi Governing Council, which was an independent body, true, appointed by the United States, but approved by the United Nations. We have to make that clear. Okay. I did not accept an appointment to work in an occupation authority. It was an Iraqi Governing Council that had U.N. sanction. Um, the violence in Iraq has been unending since 2003. Almost 300 people were killed in Baghdad last weekend by ISIL. Uh, more were killed yesterday in Baghdad. Uh, ISIL uh, didn't exist before the war. How much responsibility should Tony Blair, George Bush, the architects of that invasion, how much responsibility do you think they should take for these ongoing deaths in Iraq? I think they are responsible to the extent that they grossly mismanaged the post-war uh, landscape in Iraq, and they, and they pursued... Uh, programs and policies that fed into creating the kind of deep resentments that led to the to the outbreak of carnage. But there's there's no question in my mind that ISIL and ISIS and all those uh, Al Qaeda connected groups uh, were around, probably in the shadows in the 1990s, and they were they were established and they were given a life of their own uh, well well before the Iraq invasion. They sort of grew and and expanded uh, after after the occupation because the soil was fertile. But you can't deny that these, the, these groups had uh, established themselves firmly uh, in the mindset of the world of uh, jihadi Islam well, and, well before the occupation and, of Iraq. And how much responsibility should Iraq's political elites, Iraq's leaders take for failing to provide security uh, to the people of Baghdad and of other such cities which have been repeatedly hit by suicide bombs, car bombs and the rest. A lot of Iraqis are angry, aren't they, at the incompetence, uh, the corruption, the weakness of their leadership? No, there's no question about that. I think the Iraqi uh, some political class has a great deal of blame to take on, a great deal of responsibility for what has happened because they've proved to be a uniquely incompetent and venal uh, group that is incapable of managing uh, the, the huge crises that we have faced in that country. And they, in fact, contributed through acts of omission and commission to the uh, uh, breakdown of, or the dysfunction of the state. After, certainly after the US and the UK withdrew in 2010, I, I, I put the blame squarely on the shoulders of the political class that grossly mismanaged the affairs of the country and led us into this near abyss. Ali Alawi, there are many who would argue that the Iraqi government won't be able to defeat ISIL until something's done about the intense sectarian divisions inside of Iraq today. Uh, would you agree that, for example, human rights abuses by elements of the so-called uh, Shia militias, the popular mobilization units they call themselves, helps ISIL recruit, it helps ISIL feed off the resentment, the fear, the paranoia of the Sunni minority in places like Fallujah and Mosul? Yes, I mean, it's one thing feeds, uh, feeds into another, but uh, you have to understand that when these so-called militias, in fact, they are connected to the prime minister's office and they also have legal sanction. I don't want to uh, think of them as out-of-control groups that go around death squads and so on. They're not like that at all. Elements of them, perhaps small elements, fringe elements, do uh, commit excesses, and there's no question about that. I'm not trying to hide this fact. But they, were, they came to the scene after the Iraqi army collapsed and after uh, Daesh or ISIS was within uh, a few miles of Baghdad. So without this, these, the, the sacrifices of these people, Baghdad would probably would have been overrun uh, in, in 2014. Now, they've taken a certain life of their own, a certain status of their own. They're playing... With a great deal of Iranian involvement too, would you agree? Yes, no doubt about that. I mean, Iran is probably the uh, central most uh, important uh, element in the... Uh, organization and the command system of the uh, of the popular mobilization forces uh, but nevertheless the bulk of these people are committed uh, patriots and they have fought and they fought in many cases quite valiantly in defense of not just the but they have, all, they have also Iraq, been accusations of war crimes as, as you concede um, how do you put the sectarian genie back in the bottle in Iraq. Can it be done? There was yet another suicide attack by ISIL on a Shia mosque just yesterday in Baghdad. How do you put that sectarian genie back in the bottle? I don't think it's been ruptured totally, but we have to start a very long and laborious process of confidence building between the sects. And uh, there's many places that one can start with, but over time, I think the good sense of Iraqis will, will, will I think, overcome the strong sectarian demons that have been unleashed but uh, there isn't a, a demand, as it were, to run the country in a, in a strictly sectarian way. It does not make sense to have, for example, a Shia state in Iraq 
while ignoring the uh, civil and political rights of other communities. Uh, the fact that we had an, uh, an unbalanced state in the past doesn't mean that uh, these errors uh, should be repeated. Ali Alawi, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.